Good morning and welcome to Grace Street Church. Good morning. Good morning. So glad you're here and I'm so glad you're joining us online today. It's a great day. We're running out of these warmer days, I think, maybe, but we sure enjoy the ones that we have. Um, Wednesday nights here at Grace Street, I want to tell you about Wednesday nights. We gather here at about 7 o'clock p.m. And coming up, uh, the case for Christmas Advent study starts December 1st, and there's a book that goes with that. So I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet so you can get the book for the study. And also, if you're watching us online and you're interested in the study, uh, reach out to one of our one of our pastors listed, and we will definitely get you a book because we want you here with us. You know, I don't usually get to do announcements, and uh, so today I'm kind of enjoying this a little bit. Um, Pastor Mark is traveling, so we, of course, pray for Pastor Mark in his travels. We miss you very much, and can't wait to have you back home again. But I want to talk a little bit about Orange Track Racing. Um, and let's see, this coming Saturday, correct, is the final race of the season at 10 a.m. We will have... The November races and the season finalities. Uh, registration is at 9 a.m. for drop-offs and 9.30 a.m. for those who will be staying. Now, I have known nothing technical about orange track racing whatsoever. Terry's an expert. But I can tell you this, if, if you played with these little cars when you were kids like I had, all right, uh, Mark got to hold one during the announcements last week, and Terry didn't give me one to hold, so I went back and got one because I wanted one too. Um, but I have a ton of them, and you remember the orange tracks that you set up in Mom's living room in the way usually? Um, tons of fun, but they have a track that goes all the way from that corner and all the way back to the back of the room. And if you're interested in all and coming down, what I do know from a layperson standpoint is there are people that just come for fun and register a few cars. There's people that take it really serious and get into different levels of competition. But wherever you fall on the spectrum, you're extremely welcome here. If you just want to bring a few cars the first time just for fun, please come and join us. And if you're a novice, we look forward to seeing you again. I don't think I get to keep the little car. <laughs> you can find a mark about we, that one. We have to have. Uh, uh, what else have we got going? Uh, oh, yes, it's November 20th, uh, movie night, The Christmas Angel. The doors will open at 5.30 p.m. The movie starts at 6 p.m. Movie night's a great night. Um, I can honestly tell you I met my wife on movie night at Great Street Church. So you never know what could happen on movie night. I'm, I'm not saying that that's a you know, regular thing. Uh, I know her mom's single. I mean, I'm just throwing that out. Um, <laughs> if you're watching, I love you, my mom. <laughs> uh, but it's a free movie night. There's tickets here. Um, bring tons of people with you. It's, it's a ton of fun. Free food. You can't. I heard there's going to be maybe Christmas cookies. I've been practicing. Is. All right. She's been practicing for Christmas cookies, so that's great. Ah, oh, Christmas caroling, which I can't remember who's in charge of that. Right. Uh -huh. Carla. Carla. Carla's in charge of uh, Christmas caroling, and it's coming up soon. And we have the books uh, set aside, Carla, um, and we're looking forward to that. Um, and there'll be more, I think, uh, announcements on that coming up. So I'm going to switch jobs and go sing a little bit. Uh, and uh, get ready to worship. Just for now, I'm going to take the little car with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Hi, I'm Pastor Bruce. <laughs> okay, we like to do lots of different kinds of music at Grace Street Church. We're going to start out with a very familiar hymn. sense with the uh, with the word that's being given and, and uh, it's funny because every time I looked anything up was following a song called Waymaker was at the top of the list and uh, we haven't done it before but God put it on uh, on my heart that this song was supposed to be done and so Lori and I practiced it a little bit this morning um, Diane is always so wonderful to do our slides. We don't know where we're going. Uh, so. <laughs> that's fine. But that's, you know, she, she puts up with that a lot. So, but we love you, and, uh, and if God wanted this, us to do this song corporately together as a, as a congregation, then there's a reason for that. And, I, and it's more, it's a lot less about the skill of the people up front and a lot more about the hearts of the people that are singing the song.
morning our call to worship comes from Job 1 20 through 22. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship, he said. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Job utters a wisdom poem that portrays the wisdom of his quiet submission to the secret will of God. Everything belongs to the creator who gave it. He goes on to say, I came naked from my mother's womb and I will be naked when I leave. It's true for all of us. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. But then he goes on to say, praise the name of the Lord. God's people must praise him for whatever he does and what is his. And why is that? Why would we praise somebody that takes, that we feel takes everything away from us? Because when bad times come, and I, I don't want to get into the message, that's, I can't wait to hear what Pastor Terry has to tell us today, but when bad things come, there's only one place to turn. There's only one place for our eternal life. The word blessed or praised is the same used in verse 11 for cursed. By using it here, the author is stressing how Job has frustrated Satan's predictions in verse 11. But verse 22 implies the testing is not over. Thank you, Bruce. I brought more up with me than I normally do today. There's a, in this passage that we're going to be studying this morning, in Mark chapter 5, there's just some powerful addition to it uh, that comes from the Amplified Version. So we'll be kind of going back and forth between the New Living Testament and the Amplified Bible. But this passage out of Mark, uh, out of Mark 5, it, it's both written in Matthew in chapter 9 and also in Luke chapter 8. Um, it's interesting, I think uh, Matthew kind of reminds me when it comes to these things of he's the cliff note writer of the Gospels. His hits are always shorter. He, he wrote... Uh, <laughs> like eight verses, and, and this one is like 22 verses out of Mark. And, and in Luke, it's 16, a little bit more. Uh, so Matthew, maybe it's not as wordy. His sermons are probably a little shorter. I know Pastor Mark likes to, to kid that this would be a four hour sermon. Not, not today, but we aren't gonna go for that record. But today we are going to talk about a desperation in our life that ignites a faith that leads to God's grace which leads to making us whole there's a path here and so to get started let's if you've got your Bibles let's open them up to mark I can tell you what page but it doesn't do you any good because your Bible is going to be different than mine but we're going to start in, in with chapter 5 and just read the first a few verses of this where it says Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore then a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived and when he saw Jesus he fell at his feet pleading fervently with him my little daughter is dying Ease. And, and I can, in, in, 
and I get this from Diane's mom, Anne, in my mind's eye, I can hear him saying this, my little daughter is dying. And he's got, and if he's on his hands and knees, his, his, his tears have to be flowing down his face. And he, he says, please come and lay your hands on her, heal her. So she can live. Please. Now, Jairus was a leader in the synagogue. Now, he wasn't a Pharisee, he wasn't a Sadducee, he was just a lay leader. And um, so Matthew calls him a leader, and Luke uses the word ruler. But here in, in Mark, he says leader as well. His responsibilities included several things, including preparing for worship. So, potentially picking out some scripture to read. Opening it up for others at the end. He might even have said, are there any brothers here who have a word from God? And I, I can remember this at a previous church. Someone asked that. pastor asked that. And one of the elders stood up. And she gave a prophetic word from God. Totally impromptu. Totally not planned. She didn't come to church that morning planning on speaking. In fact, if you were to ask her, she'd tell you that she was an introvert. So to get up in front of the entire church and speak a word... That was God placing that on her heart. And so then he would also uh, help leading in prayer. And the other piece of this was is that being a lay person, just like we are with the church, he was a representative of the synagogue. So outside of the synagogue, outside of the building, he was a representative of the synagogue. So when people saw him, they knew that he was one of the lay leaders. And so they watched him very carefully. They watched him to the point um, where it's very possible that one of the, the more legalistic Jews ran and told one of the Pharisees or the Sadducees what just happened. Because they would be uh, told or even instructed not to say anything about Jesus in a positive light, for sure. We can almost think of this person, uh, Jairus, as an elder in the church or a deacon. That was his. That was his position. Um, in verses 24 and 25, we read, Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him, because all these people, they had seen what Jesus did. In fact, he had gone across the other side of the lake, but they followed. They followed him. Can you imagine? They followed him. He had, today, you know, music groups and stuff we call groupies. Radical groupies. They followed him everywhere. Here and there, and um, some didn't even know why they were following. They just were kind of going along with the group to see what was happening. But as he's walking, this is what verse 25 says. This is a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. Now I have to imagine this was physically debilitating. It had to have just drained her of absolutely every little bit of strength that she had. And certainly, it would have prevented her from getting married, let alone having a child, because it was constant. And, and if we read in Levit if we look at Leviticus 20, verse 18, it says, if a man has sexual relationships with a woman during her menstrual period, both of them must be cut off from the community, for together they have exposed the source of her blood flow. It was it made it would make them both ceremonially unclean. She was already unclean because of it, but it would make him ceremonially unclean as well. Um, and as long as she continued to suffer from this debilitating disease, she was cast out. 
she was unclean. And it's even possible that if she walked around, she may have even had to say that she was unclean so that people wouldn't come too close. You know, we, we think about the, the six-foot rule that, that we've had because of COVID. Think of that. You couldn't get too close. Because if you did and you touched her, you would be unclean. And there would be rituals that you would have to follow to become clean again. And it's not just people, but anything she touched. So if she sat down, where she sat became unclean. Her bed was unclean. Her home was unclean. This had to have been a terrible life for her. And it really does remind me of the pandemic because, you know what? Being unclean like that, she was cut off from the world. Think of the first couple of months of COVID. People were stuck in their homes. They were cut off from everyone. You couldn't go to a, a, a wedding. You couldn't go to a funeral. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't go to work. You were cut off. Now, fortunately, we have technology that allows us to communicate. They didn't have that. And by Levitical law, because she touched Jesus, the hem of his robe. And if, if we go back and think about this, um, when we talk about the hem of the robe, if we think about that, that uh, the, it was probably the tassels that we read about in, in the Old Testament that they would have on the bottom of their robe. She probably reached out and just touched him as quickly as she could. How often, she didn't, but how often do we let our problems keep us from God? Think about the things that go on in your, in, in your life and, and the things that come up and how often do they keep us from God? I can think of so many things in my life when I look back with those 2020 goggles and go, oh yeah, uh-huh, yeah, that kept me from God too. But here's the thing, no matter how or what that problem is or those problems are, we have to. We have to take them to God. I have a, um, and, and some of you know him, I have a friend who is, this is day 31, being in an induced coma. Started out with COVID and now he has pneumonia and um, he's on a ventilator. And We've gone up and we've prayed with him, we've prayed with his, with his wife, we've prayed with a group of friends last Monday. His wife, Jen, she's not letting this problem keep her from God. Like Job this morning, the, the call to worship, yes, she's in grief. She probably, I, I doubt she tore her robe. We don't, that's not something that I know she didn't shave her head or put ashes on her head. But she, she has opened her heart in grief to her family and to her friends. But she knows that God is in control. And in all of this, where it says, in verse 22, the call to worship says, In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. In all of this, Jen has not sinned by blaming God. She is clinging to, reaching to God, just like the this woman reached out and touched that robe. Verses, let's go to verse 26. It says, She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse, and she had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his, you mentioned the faith this time, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. She knew it. She believed it with all her heart and being. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of this terrible condition. Now, I'm sure that one or more of you at some time has suffered at the hands of a doctor. Think doctor, some dentist, doctor, whatever. 
I have two instances where they turned me off to both of these different professions. I went to a chiropractor once. I, I, I was walking around like this. And I'm in my 20s at the time. You're not supposed to walk around like this when you're in your 20s. <laughs> I went to a chiropractor. He threw me on three different machines. Didn't touch me at all other than tell me how to lay down. And he, he ran and did these three machines and, and then charged me almost $400. Now this is in 1988, 89. So that was a lot of money. That was like two weeks pay or more. Well, I'm never going back to a chiropractor after that. I was, I was very upset. And then, uh, oh gosh, this is probably close to 20 years ago, I went to a dentist and I had a cracked tooth. It's, it's a back one here. And there's a hole there now. But I went and they put Novi they shot me up with Novocaine. And it was, it was good for the first little while, but um, during hour two and dentist number two, who had literally crawled up on the chair and was leaning over me like this, yanking up, I could feel it. I didn't like Dennis to start with. But here's the thing, I've met a chiropractor who takes good care of me now. And I don't have to go very often because he does such a good job. He gets me nice and straight. And Dennis, I'm still skittish. It still takes me about 14 to 16 months in between going because ouch last time I went I had to have a root canal they did a good job didn't hurt but did it but she reached out and she touched his rope now Matthew and Luke say she touched the fringe while some translations say the tassel that's why I spoke about earlier like the, the tassels that the religious leaders that have and um, the tassels were often uh, blue threads that were fixed to the garments as reminders to be holy and to keep God's command. So they had a purpose. And then immediately, so uh, straight away, at once, directly, instantly, instantaneous. Can you imagine the feeling of healing washing through your body? Huh. Just imagine that, washing through your body certainly proof of the certainty and authority of God's amazing plan. Now in verse 30, Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out for him, from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? That's like walking into, going to a concert. You're, you're right up front and you're going, who touched me? And there's like 60 people right in that two foot radius of you, right? But this is the only instance where we hear this happening. And he asks, who? But here's the thing. He already knew. He already knew who had touched him. And in verse 31, his disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking. He kept on looking around to see who had done it. She had spent 12 years as an outcast. Can, so you can almost imagine how she had drifted back and was trying to hide, right? She had drifted away and she was trying to hide. But then, let's go to verses 33 and 34. And I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible because I just love the way this is put in here. He's, but the woman, knowing what had been done for her, though alarmed and frightened and trembling, so she had done something that she wasn't sure she should have done. She wasn't sure she was going to get in trouble for it. Because Jesus usually lay, went and laid hands on people to heal. But she was, she was a little frightened and a little trembling. And she fell down before him. She came back to him. She fell down before him. And he told him the whole truth. She was honest with him right from there. She just she gave it to him. And the verse 34, listen to this. And he said to her, daughter, your faith, that is your trust and confidence in me, springing from faith in God. 
So that's the part of the Amplified Bible where they draw that out and, and explain it a little more. It says, has restored you to health. Go in peace. And it's not just to go in peace, it's to go to peace. Can you imagine the peace that she felt from this? And, and it continues and says, and be continually healed and, not just healed, but and free from your disease. In other words, that distressing bodily disease, gone. You are free from it. He's basically telling her that she is made whole. Can you imagine? She is made whole. Her fear was likely a righteous fear. That righteous fear of, you know how, how the scripture tells us that we should fear God? That's not that trembling, uh, God's going to take off his belt and give me a whooping, or go <laughs> tell me to go get a switch so I can give me a smack. It's that righteous fear because he is holy and, and we are not worthy. But she in that moment, gets to experience God's grace and God's salvation. This touch would change. You know, I, I, Mark, or Bruce, you said last week that you didn't have that epiphany, that aha moment of coming to Christ. Those of us growing up in the church often don't. Others do. But this was one, of, this was kind of like that. It was that life-changing moment, that, that change of reaching out to Christ in faith. God knows everything that's going to happen. So you got to know that Jesus went in this way with Jairus on purpose, intentionally, because he knew that she was going to come. And this is what we talk about this all the time. You know, everybody says, well, predestination and this and that. Here's, here's my take on, on that. God knows each and every person that's going to choose him. That's why he's waiting for that last person. He knows who that is. He knows them by name. He knows the hairs on their head. He knows everything about them. He knows when they're coming and, and when they will be born. That will be when Jesus comes. So yes, we are predestined, but God, it's because God's all knowing that he knows this. It's not like the person that's walking down the street who doesn't know Jesus. Just because that doesn't mean they are destined to know Jesus. I, I like to take the pre off of that. Everyone is destined to meet Jesus. How we meet that, Him in a believing or unbelieving fashion, that's up to each one of us. Power is not in faith, but in seeing Jesus as the solution to the problem which requires that faith. Let me say that again. Power is not in faith, but in seeing Jesus as the solution to the problem which requires faith. This is the model for the kind of faith that Jairus had. As a leader in the synagogue, again, he would have been instructed not to even acknowledge Jesus' presence. He did it anyway because it was this faith that Jesus will respond to. This is a model for our lives. And here's, here's something interesting that I found. Jesus, or uh, this woman, she is the only woman that Jesus calls daughter. Verse 35 continues and says, While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, they told him, your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. Can you imagine? We, we've just seen this woman just been washed by the blood of Jesus. 
he's, 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 she's been healed completely, tr completely transformed. Now this deep sorrow had to have washed over him at the thought. But I love this next verse. But Jesus overheard them, and he said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just have faith. It goes back to seeing Jesus as the solution to the problem that is requiring that faith. And then verse 37 says, Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except for Peter, James, John, the brother of James. Jesus does not at all say that she is dead. He said, don't be afraid, just have faith. When I think about the three disciples that he takes with him, that, that just takes me back a couple of chapters to Mark chapter 3. This is at the transfiguration. See, afterward, Jesus went up on the mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. See, Jesus poured himself out to the 12 apostles for three years. Jesus has been pouring himself out to us for our entire lives. We may not have realized it, but he does and has been. And they, in turn, would do the same. And Jesus is also calling us to do the same. Paul references several disciples of Christ that he poured himself into, including Timothy and Titus. In addition to the transfiguration, there's also Jesus, when he goes on his last night he, uh, at, before he's crucified, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he goes there to pray, who does he take with him? Peter, James, and John. Scriptures say they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. Well, we all know from uh, reading the scriptures that they would eventually, they would fall asleep. They're human. How many times have you fallen asleep at a time where, when you realize that you've done it, it's like, oh jeez, what did I just do? Who did I just let down? You know, all these things that run through your mind. But here's the thing. If we jump back to the, our scripture from this morning, it says in verses 38 and 39, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and he asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. He's prophesying. He's, he's not saying that she wasn't dead, but that he was willing and able to wake her from that death. Now, yeah, let's think about this. People uh, think that are with him had to think the same thing as the disciples when Jesus said, and this is from John chapter 11. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will get better soon. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. What he doesn't tell in this particular passage from Mark, he doesn't say the child is dead. He says she isn't dead. She's only asleep. And in verse 40, this is there's no difference between the people then and the people today. The, the crowd laughed at him, the scriptures tell us. They laughed at him. But he, he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. The people didn't understand that metaphor, that she was only sleeping. The Greek word translated as sleep here was translated as death and several other 
New Testament passages. So, I always thought this was interesting. You got the family there that's grieving and crying and weeping, and you got friends. But part of that crowd would have been, they had professional mourners who helped those who had lost someone express their grief. And we think that's kind of a, a, a silly thing to do, but, you know, three years ago, I thought Grubhub was a silly thing. They had people that came and helped them grieve. But he made them leave for several reasons. Number one, because they didn't understand. Number two, he had to remove their negativity so it wouldn't affect the girl's parents. Get rid of them. He's it's almost like saying, get rid of the negative in your life. Jesus... was not interested in making this a big display. He just had the parents and the three disciples with him. That's it. Just a small group. It was all about the girl, her parents, and ultimately his mission here. Verse 41 says this, holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, and he probably didn't do it so solemnly. He probably said, little girl, get up. And she rose up. This is how the scripture records it. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. And Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. In this one passage, Jesus is ultimately made unclean twice. Once by the woman who had bled for 12 years. And once because he touched it. A dead body. These two, like us, are the ones that Jesus came to reach. And it just all goes back to the church. This church is not a resort for Christians. It's a place for sinners to come find healing. I have my sin. I don't know what you are saying. That's not my business. That's between you and God. And you have to wrestle. You have to work that out with God. This, people don't like it when you say, well, this is a hospital for sinners. Well, if you've come and repented, then you're not a sin. Well, uh, sorry. Um, we still continue to sin, so we're still sinners. That's the world we live in. So, um, it's a constant thing. That's why I keep going back to the scriptures every day and reading them. That's why I, I try to share with everyone what this book says and what, who Jesus is and what he is about. And the words that, that Jesus spoke were not special. They're simply what Jesus said in his native Aramaic. Here's the thing. When he said, Talitha kum, or little girl get up, he didn't say it passively. He said it with authority because he was speaking over death. He was speaking over our sin. And the effect of both of these miracles was astonishment. Both of them were immediate. The woman who had been suffering from the bleeding, she instantly felt that healing. The 12 year old girl, she instantly stood up and started walking around. There was no need for recovery time. 
But isn't it interesting, at the very end, that last verse, that Jesus gives strict orders not to tell anyone what they saw. He wasn't interested in fame. He did not want the news of his miracles to spread. And you just see it today. Everybody had their phones out taking a video, posting it on social media. God's plan required that Jesus' popularity did not grow too quickly. Didn't want it to grow too quickly because you, you, it's like a plant growing. When you, you uh, in springtime, you cultivate the ground and you plant the seed. Now, granted, if you're planting your garden, you're doing it by hand. If you come from a farm family, you know the big dumpling lets you do it, but you plant it. And then over time, the God waters it. In some places, they have irrigation systems, but the ground is prepared, there's planting, there's uh, feeding of the soil, there's the watering, and there's the waiting. Because it's not a sprint, it's a, it's a marathon. It takes time. And over time, that seed's going to slowly break open. This dead seed is going to break open and it's going to sprout up and it's going to grow something beautiful. It's going to grow either a beautiful flower, it might be some kind of a, a seasoning that you might use in cooking, or it may be food in general. And things are used, that, you know, this. In, this, in Iowa, we've got soybeans and corn, and they have found so many more ways to use those things. Even now, the corn, even once the corn is done being harvested, some farmers will go out and they cut the base, the, what's left of the stock up, and they bring a, a rake in, and they rake it up, and then they bale it. And it's used to feed the livestock. Every piece used. <coughs> When Jesus would come and he would heal or he would cast out demons, the people that were affected would come to know who he was. And when it came to the demons, they definitely, people may not know who Jesus is real well, but the demons sure know who he is and they're scared of him, as they rightly should be. But Jesus demands silence. He commands Silence. He wants people to, to not talk about it. But do people listen? No. No, they don't. They ignored him. People wanted to share the amazing things that he had seen and done. And, and, and as you notice, like in the music today, and, and even with this slide, the music, every slide has a piece missing. Because until, and I, I see this as the hand of God, putting that piece in. Until he puts that piece in. Until we ask him for that. It then makes us whole. He then makes us whole. By law, they were unclean. By law, by our sin, we are unclean. <clears throat> by grace, they were given life. By grace, we are given life. God's response to our faith in him is that redeeming grace. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether it was uh, a parent coming for their child, seeking Jesus out in faith, or the woman seeking Jesus out in faith, or the four friends who lowered their, their fifth friend down in front of Jesus from, they mean they ripped up somebody's roof and lowered him down in. That's faith. They knew Jesus would heal. It's when we pursue God in this way that we're made home. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to hear your word today. That it is in your word that we find truth. And it's in that truth that we can see your love, your mercy, your grace, and your forgiveness. And it's when we reach out to you in that faith, when we seek you with all our hearts, that 
just as you did for the woman and the child in our passage today. We are made whole. Thank you, Father, for making us whole, for giving us eternal life with you, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name. sure if we've got an online connection right now or not so if you can still see me hi we're still here if not well you can't tell that i'm going to tell you to watch youtube later <laughs> the screen went completely blank on that camera so we'll be working on that but right now in faith let's go to the lord's table It is because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. This meal represents what we, or how we are made whole. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke the bread. In doing so, he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Then a little bit later in the meal, probably right around the time that they would have been singing a third, like a third hymn. He took the cup and he filled it up again. Saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for the sins of many. Take and drink. When we read the scriptures, it tells us as often as we do this, do so in remembrance of me. Do so in remembrance of what Jesus did did for us that giving that he gives all of us as sinners. The body of Christ broke for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father, as we prepare to come into this time of prayer, the prayers for the people, Father, we just thank you for what your Son did on the cross for us. That is by your grace, your love, your mercy, and your forgiveness that we are healed and made whole. In Jesus' name. thing that um, that song Waymaker was on my mind all week long and I sang it every day so I want to thank Bruce and Lori for bringing it to life this morning it really just it really spoke to me so thank you thank you so much yes praise God so um, so if anyone would like prayers for the people today um, uh, Terry what um, it's Jen and Joe Joe, Hawks. Joe that's what I was thinking so um, Wednesday we were starting, um, we were talking about prayer Wednesday night. So this morning I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, the greatest commandment, uh, Mark 12, 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So I'd like to just start the prayer with the first line of the Lord's Prayer. And if you all say it with me and then I'll take it from there. So our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So, Father God, we lift up our praise and honor and glory to you this morning. And we thank you for another day of life and breath. We thank you for amazing grace that you show us each day, even when we don't see it. We lift up those that need your healing power today, Lord. I pray for Jen and Joe and Steve, Jen, Larry, and my daughter, Carrie. And uh, we ask that you comfort and heal by your will, Lord. Give them the breath of life that only comes from you. Put prayerful people in their lives to guide them on their path to righteousness. By the power of your blood and the word of your testimony, lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
scriptures as you're studying. And I, and I go to the blessing that you gave last week at the end of your sermon, or Bruce. You said, and this comes from Numbers chapter 6. It's a priestly blessing that God gave. And we're used to hearing the Lord bless you and keep you. Listen to how this works. <laughs> the Lord bless you and watch. Guard. The Lord make his face to shine upon and enlighten and be gracious to you. In other words, be kind, merciful, and giving a favor. The Lord lift up his countenance, his approving countenance upon you and give you peace, tranquility of heart, and life continually. May you feel the healing in your life that the woman and the child in our passage felt today. May you feel that throughout your life as you reach out to God and ask for healing, for whatever your circumstance. Father, we just thank you that you have continually been with us, been walking by our side, never leaving us, even when we stray from it and may not even realize that you are there. You are. As the song that Pastor Bruce so beautifully picked for this morning, Father, you are the way maker. Show us the way, Father. Guide us and direct us throughout the rest of our lives. In Jesus' precious and holy name.